Thank you, Kate. Wow. Well, that's an old song. I've heard in a while. Oh, what a Savior is God. I hope you feel a kinship with that. Unto the uttermost. He's wonderful and glorious. Oh, what a Savior is mine. I, you know, I, I can identify Sister Jan and another grandbaby in the family. I tell you what, our four, they were born. You know, I young on the face of the globe like those men, you know. But I tell you still, though, there's one even more wonderful. Amen. So, I, I just believe if you're saved, you like to hear Jesus brag about it. I really do. I'll stay here after all through the lunch and put the brag on my granddad. I'll be glad to do it. But I tell you what, you start bragging about Jesus. I believe Christians just find in that something very attractive. Amen. All right, take your Bibles and turn with me now back to the book of, there you go, chapter 1. We will conclude chapter 1 today. Luke chapter 1, verse 19 through verse 22. Let me ask you, do you, ever, do you ever ask yourself questions? I do. One, I like, I, I don't know, I don't choose, I don't like that, but I find myself asking, it says, self, when will you learn? I am notorious about picking on this sofa. Sophie, she's a little quiet, if you better, that's the way she is. She's not boisterous like me, she's a quiet spirit. I'm all the time picking on her. The other night, we, she wanted to stop by cookout and just, just pick up a, a snack to take to the house to eat. Just, she likes their quesadilla. <clears throat> and uh, so we did the drive through and got her a quesadilla. And she wanted a, a, a Dr. Pepper. So I ordered her a regular Dr. Pepper. And I got me a, I think a BLT or something. I didn't want to drink and go to own it. So, you know, of course, you know, I, that, that drive through is always a challenge, you know. Hearing them, they hear you. So I get up to the window. She had the, the quesadilla, but she brought out this like, huge dark pepper. So, you know, all right, we'll split it when we get to the house. And so on the way home, I began to pick on her about something. I don't remember what it was. I was ribbing her. We get out of the car. We go up to the back door. There's a bench right by the back door. And I sat down with a huge dark pepper on that bench. Open door for her to go in. And I reached down for that <coughs> Drink and I would have come up and I about lost it. This left hand's up, so I, re I, mean, I, I quickly I got over and grabbed And when I did, my thumb went through that star. <laughs> <laughs> so here I am trying to hold a lid on it with a drink like this sideways, <laughs> trying to salvage her drink, but also knowing I'm about to make a mess, you know, that <laughs> sticky syrup. And, and honestly, the thought came because I was picking on her badly. Son, when will you learn? <laughs> it, seems, it seems to always backfire on me. You know? It's like the Lord just said, you're just setting yourself up for nothing, buddy. <laughs> well, when will we learn that our God is the all-wise God? He's not behind on anything. Man does not get something over God. Your circumstances are not a mystery to Him. <clears throat> I want you to think with me today about the wisdom of God. Now, we'll get to it really toward the end of the message. But I hope that you will think seriously about this. Our God truly is omniscient. He is all-knowing. There's nothing knowable that our God does not know. I mean, you know, Google's a rather interesting thing, isn't it? I mean, you can, you can Google just... I guess billions of things. And something will come up. I don't know if it's correct or not, but something comes up. You know, you can find something. But you know what? It's still limited. There is no limit with the knowledge of God. Why do we fret? Why do we worry? Why do we become anxious? Why do we treat God as if somehow or another the Holy Trinity should have an emergency session? On my behalf. Why are we like that? When will we learn? Our God is wise. You got your Bible open now. Ruth chapter 1, verse 19. Now, the two of them, of course, that's Naomi and Ruth. If you've not been with us, if you've never read the book of Ruth, go and read. It's only four chapters. You introduced to a family of four Father Limelech, Mother Naomi, their two boys, Chilean and Malon. 
They decided they think they must leave Bethlehem. Things look difficult there. They moved over to Moab, which was a bad decision. But nonetheless, they do that. The two boys find wives there. And yet the dad and two boys also died there. And now these women who very likely were destitute. And yet word comes back that there is once again bread in the house of bread. <coughs> Bethlehem. And so Naomi is now returning. Her, her two daughter-in-laws have been following her. At some point she says, look, there's no point in going with me. I can't give you another husband. And Orma turns back. Of course, Ruth says that familiar word, entreat me not to leave you. Where you go, I'll go. You God will be my God, your people, my people. And so now they're heading on. It says now in verse 19, this is Naomi and Ruth. Now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. And it happened when they had come to Bethlehem that all the city was excited because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? Now we're talking some 10 years later. <clears throat> You don't ever have the experience of seeing somebody you went to school with, do you? You say, boy, they've aged. <laughs> you know? I wonder what they say, right? Is this Naomi? But she said to them, do not call me Naomi pleasant. Call me Mara or bitter. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi? Since the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has afflicted me. So Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab. Now here it is. Now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. Now stay with that a little bit. I want you to note three things with me this morning. First of all, I want you to note with me that there was the experience of Naomi and Ruth's travel. You see, they didn't hop in a car and drive those few miles from Moab over to Bethlehem quickly. They walked from Moab to Bethlehem. And it would take time for them to make their journey. And so you think about that that traveling, it gave them time to remember. Now, of course, that remembrance would come through Naomi. But you, you have to believe that at some point, as Naomi is literally retracing the steps in reverse order, that she and her husband and sons had taken some ten years earlier in leaving Bethlehem to go to Moab, she is now... In that, on that same path of going back to Bethlehem. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever noticed that the Lord does not give instant relief to our moral and spiritual failures? Forgiveness, yes. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He does not drag out forgiveness. Aren't you glad of that? Aren't you thankful? There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ. Forgiveness, yes. But restoration is a process that takes time. And again, Naomi is walking back on that same trail she had taken some ten years earlier. You got to wonder, what was the conversation like? What was Naomi saying to Ruth? Those hours, or ever how long it was, it took for them to make that journey on foot. I wonder what she thought about. I wonder if she saw a landmark. If she saw something, we stopped there in the shade and we took a break. We, we bought some food with us and we stopped there to eat and to, to drink some, some water. Maybe you've heard somebody make the statement, well, what a difference is it going to matter in a hundred years? You'd ask Naomi the question, Naomi, what difference does 10 years make? Naomi could have said, well, 10 years ago I had a husband and two sons. We were so sure, we were so confident in ourselves that we thought the one thing we must do was leave Bethlehem for Moab. Seemed to us it's our only option then maybe there is this far away look in her eyes. 
Naomi might have said, sure wish I could go back to that day when we made that decision. I say that to say this to you parents, and I'm so grateful you have a good number of children here, young families. Parents, I urge you to be careful in establishing your priorities. In fact, parents, if you don't make priorities for your family, somebody else will make the priorities for your family. They'll do that. They'll be illustrated. I thank God for the parents I have. Now, when I was growing up as a boy, there was not a whole lot of the other things that are so prevalent today and abundant. But if you had known Henry Marshall, my dad, you would have known when God saved that man and my mom, you would know that that man, man was indeed the leader of our home. He was. Now, now my mama was the queen of the home. She was. And us four boys respected mama. You know why? Because my daddy loved mama. And you didn't show disrespect to him, the one he loved the most. Now, they loved us. But they had their priorities right. And I'm telling you, Sunday was the Lord's day. And I mean that. Sunday was the Lord's day. And Wednesday night, and I'll tell you what, every week they had us in Sunday school. We heard the message Sunday morning, Sunday night, and we were back on Wednesday night. And what I remember is once a year, once a year, the Wizard of Oz would come on Sunday night. <laughs> My soul, can't we stay on one Sunday night and see the Wizard of Oz? <laughs> Didn't happen. It did not happen. Now, I'm not here to be hard on anybody, but parents, there are so many things now begging you to involve your children and to go in every direction and listen to us talk today as families. We are so busy. How many of you actually sit down for the evening meal together? Really? When did you last sit down as a family for the evening meal? You remember Jesus in, Matt, in excuse me, Revelation 3? I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open the door, I'll come in. Do you know what he's referring to there? The evening meal. Now we understand during the day, we have our responsibilities. We, we, the kids are off to school. And mom and dad's working. We understand that. You know, Jesus said, I want time with you when you can sit down at the table with me and you're not in a rush. We ask you, do you turn off the TV while the meal's going? Do you, do you shut down the cell phone while you're sitting at the table together? <clears throat> hey, hear me. There are people that will, will make priorities for you if you don't make them yourself. That's the, just the truth. So I beg of you. As the only would have gone back and said, Boy, I sure wish we had had some different priorities back then, and here we let them go. There, there's a little, it's only like six pages, I think. You can find it on the internet. It's called The Tyranny of the Urgent. It is by Charles Hummel. H-U-M-M-E-L. The Tyranny of the Urgent. Hey, we've got a good illustration. Remember Martha and Mary? Remember Jesus comes to the home? Now, for, for Martha, what was urgent? What was urgent for Martha? To prepare a meal. Remember? What was important to Mary? To sit at the feet of Jesus. Remember? Now listen, you, you've got to watch out. I've got a dear friend. Now he, he heads up a ministry in Raleigh. He's a great guy. Good ministry. But just by every email he sends out begins with the word urgent. And I want to tell him, look friend, everything can't be urgent. Now I know we feel passionate about things. It's easy to get caught up in that trap. But I'm telling you, that's, that's where we are today. And it's like you're living your life and all of a sudden, oh, my, i got to go there. i got to do this. And not realizing it's really a trap. And so be careful. You see, our God is a God of wisdom. And he tells us as children we are to walk in wisdom, right? Be careful. Well, that urgency sometimes is like this. Well, their parents do that. They let them do that. Well, it must be urgent, hasn't it? Hey, be careful. Be careful. But you see, so, so the traveling gave them time to think. You see, it's good for God to put us on the back burner sometimes. It's good sometimes for God to put us on our back. It really is. 
It's good for God sometimes to, to cancel things that we thought we had to be a part of. Do you notice how we, excuse me, have you noticed how we can be? Now, you know, we get a lot of snow down here. Don't we? A lot, don't we? No, we don't. <laughs> we get snow that shuts us down for a day or two, and watch how we act. I've got cabin fever, you know? <laughs> The thought of things just coming to a halt. And yet, there's somewhere in the Bible a verse. My wife said it to me the other day. I caused the last couple of weeks. All I've done is walk around the yard and say, Boy, I sure would like to get that project done. I'd like to do this, I'd like to do that. She said, Jack, be still and know I'm God. I want to say, Hush! <laughs> but I knew I, she was right. She said, You don't like that. A moment of stillness and silence and just waiting for the Lord to deal with us, speak to us, and just for us to listen. Time to think. But also, but also this traveling, see, for them, it was a means of testing of their resolve. Because at any moment they could have opted to do what? Turn back. And yet each step that they took was a growing, stronger no to Moab and a yes to Bethlehem. There's a song in it, Each Step I Take. That is to be daily practice in our lives. For well, you see, God's children, their chief characteristic is to be their perseverance. It is to endure it is to persevere, to go on. God uses not only our trials, but the time in our trials. Because what He is doing, He is disclosing. He is manifesting our character. There's reason God lets uncomfortable things come in our lives. You see, if I push this and spill it, am I determining the content? content? No, I'm not. I'm just what? I'm disclosing the content. You see, and that's what God does in our lives. God knows our inside, but God is disclosing the character that is in us. In the past three weeks, I've had three ultrasounds. They put so much of that jelly on me. I told my family last night, I said, I felt like a greased pig. You know that stuff that you should know about ultrasounds? I've had four CT scans, and I've got a fifth one scheduled tomorrow. I don't know what else they can see in me, but they keep looking. <laughs> Do you know what? There's one who really sees the inside. He can see better than any MRI, X-ray, CAT scan, ultrasound, you name it. The psalmist said in Psalm 139.1, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. Now, God does not send trials into our lives in order that He might find out our character. He knows. But He uses the trials to expose our character. Because you know what? Jack can become blind to Jack. Jack can become blind to my, my freckles and blemishes and all those things. I've accepted them. I need God to show me. In fact, at the end of that same psalm, the psalmist said in Psalm 139, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of lasting. He's wanting to find out. I hear people sometimes say, Well, now if I know my heart, you don't. You don't know your heart. The Bible says what? The heart is deceitful, desperately wicked. Who can know it? Only God. But God's interest is not merely to embarrass me or to you know, just manifest my character. What does God want to do with our character? He wants to develop it. He wants to deepen it. And I don't think Naomi probably really appreciated it then. And maybe we don't appreciate it enough now. But you know, when, when God saves a person, you know what He does? He enrolls them in school. Did you know that? All of God's children are in school. You are. And God is in the business of teaching you. He's in the business of developing you as one of His youngs. You know, sometimes people will say, well, once saved, always saved. Don't use that. Don't use that. 
know what that sounds like to unsaved people? A cop out. It sounds like an excuse. I, I've got to get out of jail card. Once saved, always saved. Now, doctrinally, it is true. Once God saves you, you will be forever saved. God gives us to get eternal life. But don't use that. Let me tell you what rather is true. Once saved, it is from that point on always sanctification. Are you familiar with that word, sanctification? It's an important word in the Bible. The Bible teaches us that we have been set apart, sanctified in the Lord Jesus. Now, there is a positional sanctification that you've been set apart in Jesus. But there is also the very process of sanctification. Brother Ken and I were speaking about just one service. The Bible tells me in Romans chapter 8, that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. And we we're told what that purpose is in that very same passage. It is to conform you and I to the likeness of Jesus Christ. Now I look around this room, and you look up here at this preacher, there's one thing we know. He's still got work to do, right? But he's doing it. God is in the business of conforming us to the image of His Son. Years ago, this track came in the mail. I keep one in my Bible. And I have said this and I mean it. <clears throat> Aside from the scriptures, I don't know of any words that have been more meaningful to me than this little track. And the title of it is, and again, this is something you find online also. Others may, you cannot. See, I find sometimes with Christians, they think God has just cloned us all. And we're all just, everything's going to be identical. What God does with this person, he's going to do with this person, he's going to do with me. I submit that's not so. In fact, here's the way the author put it. He said, if God has called you to be really like Jesus, He will draw you into a life of crucifixion and humility. God's call will put such demands of obedience on you that you will not be able to follow other people or measure yourself by other Christians. At times, He will let other people do things which He will not let you do. Other Christians who seem very religious will push themselves, pull wires, and work schemes to carry out their plans. You cannot. And if you attempt it, you will meet with failure and rebuke from the Lord. Others may boast of themselves, of their work, of their successes. But the Holy Spirit will not allow you to do such things. And if you begin it, He will lead you to despise yourself and all your good works. And it goes on. But it makes a very important point. We are not our own. And when God has saved us, He has enrolled us in His school. He is the teacher. And He is going to work in our life to do that which is good in His sight. And so here this process is, as they're walking back to Bethlehem, it was a time, it was a time for thinking, yes. But it was also a time for them in the matter of their resolve to press on, to go on to Bethlehem. Second thing I would have you to note with me, and that is that there was the error of Naomi's thinking. As you read the text and you read the words that are used by Naomi, there are a number of things that I think become very apparent. One, Naomi focused upon God's chastening, but forgot God's compassion. Now she could just as easily have said, I went out full and the Lord has brought me home again, period. But she didn't say that. She says, what? The Lord has brought me home again. What? Empty. Now hear me. It is true the Lord chases. Amen? The Lord chases. He is not a father that spoils his youngins. He's not one who just says, one, two, you know, he starts counting, but never does anything. You know? Rather, he disciplines his youngins. <coughs> but the truth is, those he chastens, he loves. Amen? That's the truth. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. And the scripture is on the same this very passage. If you do not experience the chastening of the Lord, you're not one of his. It's an illegitimate claim to, to claim to be 
a child of God, and he never, ever chastens you. He's going to chasten his children. He's going to do what is necessary to deal with that will that is rebellious and bring them back home again. But see, Naomi, she, she focused on the chastening, but she forgot the compassion of God. Also, Naomi, she focused upon her consequence for living in Moab, but for God, it was her choice to leave Bethlehem. And here is where many today choose to live. And that is they refuse to accept responsibility for their lives and the choices they have made that have put them where they are. It's so easy to blame others, isn't it? I mean, it's my upbringing. It was mom and daddy's fault. I'm 55 years old and I'm still blaming on mom and daddy. You know? It's the environment. It's the culture we live in. Now, children can be victims of parents. That is true. And other adults' decisions. Children are growing up in a very cruel society today, aren't they? It is. Our hearts should break for children. But there must come a time when we take personal responsibility for our lives. I love that over in uh, 1 Corinthians 13 where Paul said, you know, he said, when I was a child, he, you know, I spake as a child, I understood as a child. But then he said this, but when I became a man, I have preached that more than one time at Tar Lane and using that to the teenagers, to the UCC, that you are in the process of what? Of becoming. You are becoming an adult. I've seen 16-year-olds who acted very mature. I've seen 35-year-olds act very childish. You are becoming an adult. And the good news is that even if you have come from a home of just horrendous cycles, where maybe you can trace it back to grandparents, great-grandparents, these cycles of choices and consequences, kind of like the book, of judges. Boy, you see it there, don't you? Look at judges. It's a book of cycles. And you can look, you can trace it back. And there's a heritage that is really not honorable, but dishonorable. I've got good news for you today. The cycle can be broken. That's why I love 2 Corinthians 5 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Hear me. Your granddaddy or your daddy does not have to haunt you the rest of your whole life. You can walk away from that by the grace of God, by the power of God. You don't have to live like granddaddy lived. Amen? Amen. Now, I, I thank God again for the parents I had. I thank God I have no right to stand before you today to claim any kind of a son of a, of a, of a, of a, of a brutal or, or cruel or anything unhealthy, un, unwholesome in my life. I was so richly blessed. But I know that is not the same for me. But my friend, I beg of you today, as an adult, take responsibility now for the choices in your life. Step up to the plate. Be that man. Be that woman. <clears throat> Naomi also, she focused upon her misery, but she forgot God's mercy. You see, Naomi, by the mercy of God, survived Moab. She's going back home to Bethlehem. But you, know what, you know how she's thinking? I'm a victim. I'm a victim. Naomi would not use the words of Psalm 23, 6. Surely goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life. Everyone here is on the ground of mercy today. And I, those of you who are not saved, you're definitely on the ground of mercy. Because you could be in hell already. You could have been an ATV accidentally taking your life. There could be a Plot developing in you, go to your brain, give you a massive stroke to take you out of here. You're on the ground of mercy today. You need to bow before your God and thank you for that and plead for mercy upon your soul to forgive you of your sins. You see, Naomi thought selfishly and she spoke bitterly. 
I mean, what Naomi in essence is saying is, life is not fair. I got big news for all of you today. Life is not fair. This life is not fair. It's a fallen world. It is a, a distorted, twisted world. In the beginning, we, we were looking at this briefly Wednesday night. In the beginning, God said, what? It's good. It's very good. Do you know what it says in Romans 8 about creation now? It grows. You know why? Sin has entered the world and things aren't perfect. And things aren't going to be fair. You may qualify and someone doesn't get the, get the promotion instead of you. Life is not fair. It's going to happen. Naomi was concerned about the reason for her troubles but seemed indifferent to her response to her troubles. Any of you familiar with Philip Yancey? He's an author. He wrote some excellent books. What's so amazing about grace? Where is God when it hurts? In this, I'll give you a quote of his. He says, suffering involves two main issues. One, cause. Why am I suffering? Who did it? And two, response. By instinct, most of us want to figure out the cause of our pain before we decide how to respond. And then a man by the name Paul Poitier wrote, what counts is the way a person reacts in the face of suffering. That is the real test of the person. What is our personal attitude to life and its changes and chances? And one other, I don't, we don't have this here, but it's Matthew Henry. He says, it is not an affliction itself, but an affliction rightly born that does us good. <laughs> Dear, I think I mentioned his name recently, Pastor Bill Sutton at Blue Creek for many years. As he approached retirement, his sweet wife Patsy developed cancer. And in retirement, stayed as they moved to Dillsboro, she would die. But he told me, she said to him, she said, I for a while was saved. Why me? She said, I've come to say, why not me? Oh, beloved, <clears throat> Naomi was wrong in her thinking. And we can be wrong too, can't we? We can ask things like, where is God? Doesn't God understand? Doesn't God care? Do you remember when Jesus arrived with Mary and Martha? Remember what they said? Lord, if... That same preacher Bill said, I heard it at a funeral one time, he preached those, used those two words, Lord, if. One, Lord, well, that's the word of assurance, said, Lord, yes. But if is the word of question and doubt. Lord, if you come, Lord, if you haven't been late, Lord, if you haven't let us down, see how those things take you into dangerous territory? Oh, friend, don't go there. Wait upon the Lord. Let Him renew your strength. Finally, let me put a thought here, and that is this one. There was the exactness of God's timing. The exactness of God's timing. The scripture says that Naomi and Ruth returned and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. If you've not read the rest of the book, you, you can't appreciate that. But though you can't have, you know what this is leading to. This is just, you see, see, chapter one, chapter one is the most really unpleasant part of the book. But God is faithful in His Word. God doesn't just give us the sugar. He gives us the bitter stuff also, doesn't He? He, he doesn't just give us the honey. No, He gives us the full message, you see. And so you have to deal with chapter one. But man, the way the book was divided for us when they began to make it in chapters and verses, here you've got just a little more statement here and it is about to set you up for some good stuff to come. First thing, it was harvest time. It was harvest time. And the time of harvest will be critical in the remaining portion of the book of Ruth. Ruth is going to need a job. They didn't have welfare. They didn't have handouts. She is going to have to go to work in order to feed Naomi and herself. And yet, look, she is getting out. I'll just go ahead and tell you that. You see, under the law, when they harvested their grain, they were not to harvest it completely. Under the law, they were to leave places where the poor could go and gather grain. 
Boy, couldn't we learn from that today? Don't just hand it out. Make them earn it, but give it. But provide it for them. Provide it for them, but they got to come get it. I know some of y'all remember E.J. Hines. I remember, this has been years ago, years ago, out in front of Oslo Moral Hospital. There still are pine trees out there. But that, this has been years ago. They thinned them out. And they thinned them out. They cut up firewood. And they found out people that used firewood. And they carried it to their home. Well, a second time, they cut more firewood. And so they contacted those people and said, look, you're going to need to come get the firewood this time. Well, you know what? They didn't come get it. Well, I'm about to chase a rabbit there, and I need to get off. <laughs> but, but Ruth has, a, has a, a very practical but a very real need. It's, it's harvest time. Now, the unbeliever would look at that and say, ah, coincidental. Boy, they sure were lucky. When will we learn? That is not the way our God operates, beloved. I hope you don't see life as chance and luck. But the believer is to look at life and see God in the circumstances. Proverbs 3, 6, you know it says, In all your ways, what? Acknowledge Him. We, I attended the wedding, Sophie and I, just a little week ago, well, a week ago, yesterday. And to that young couple, I said, I hope and pray you have a God acknowledged life. You see God in your marriage, and others will be able in turn to see God in your marriage. The psalmist in Psalm 31 wrote, But as for me, I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. That's the way to live. You don't have to fear tomorrow. You don't have to find yourself fretting and sweating about life. But rather, there is this confidence in God. We have our responsibilities, but He has His too. And his responsibilities are far greater than ours, aren't they? Why do you have throughout the Bible this statement, fear not, be not afraid, again and again and again. It's one thing God does not want his people to be fearful. I think it was a few Wednesday nights ago, the first one we did, we have a little series on the promises of God. And since I was setting up the study, I picked out my favorite one. Isaiah 41.10. I love those words. In the old English it says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. And I've told of many a belief of those words. I've many a time. In fact, one dear brother, he would have cancer. He was in the hospital. I went to walk in the room, and his wife had printed those words out and put them in a frame for him to have in his hospital room. Oh, friend, God does not want us to fear. And when, you, when you can come home to this truth, God knows what he's doing. Now, we're to walk in obedience, yes. We're to walk by faith, yes. But as we put the Lord first in our lives, friends, Things are not going to be accidental. They're going to be providential. There will come much more for Ruth and Naomi. Something Ruth and Naomi could never have imagined. God is going to use harvest time. Just Ruth going out and gleaning of the grain. God will use that to connect two strangers. And that is going to result in a courtship. And that courtship is going to lead to marriage. And that marriage to a family. And through that family, God will use that to contribute to His great prophetic plan of the ages. And I'll go ahead and tell you, and King David will be coming. But more than that, more than that, King Jesus will be coming. Did it look like it for two destitute widows walking down a dirty, dusty trail heading to Bethlehem? But it was harvest time. Could you walk 
In addition to that, it was a holy time. You see, barley harvest would have been during the time, the month of Passover, and the first fruits. What do you think about that? What a time for a backslider to return home and a new believer to come home. Naomi needed restoration. We saw last Sunday how her faith was so abated, had so shriveled down, she wouldn't even recommend her faith to Orba. She go back to your gods. She needs restoration. Aren't you glad we serve a God of restoration? Aren't you glad the psalmist said that the Lord restores our soul? You know what? We all are back after leaving Celebrate Recovery, heading home last Sunday. You know I just said? I said, we are all broken. We're all broken. We don't all have the same shortcomings, the same weaknesses. The Bible says the sin that so easily ensnares you. It is easy for me to really jump on some sins. You know why? That's not the ones that really are my hang-up. I don't tend to get quite as uh, overworked with my own sins. But you know what? We're all broken. And like Naomi, we all need restoration. Hey, Ruth needed justification. And, and, and he, the Passover points to the coming of the Messiah who would shed his blood for our sins, saving us from the wrath of the Holy Judgment. And the first fruits points to the resurrection of Jesus, for he is the first fruit of them that slept. Now hear me. Naomi and her family had made a mess of things. Anybody here never made a mess? I just told you one I made the other night. And so help me, my wife, my bless her heart, she got the wet paper towel, she started wiping. We sat down and ate that while I got my sock and I said, uh-oh, there's another sticky spot, you know. We're all mess makers, beloved. Listen, I'll tell you, I can really make a mess. I can walk away from here and get in my vehicle and get down there to the stop sign, turn, get to a fountain down, and get out and start. And somebody pulls out in front of me, and I have just preached a glorious message. <laughs> you know what I did? I make a message. And the Holy Spirit, who seems to always be right there by my side. Hey, we all do it. We all do it. But God is going to make a difference in the only other room. An eternal difference that will bow to His glory. For our group. And interesting enough, it all will begin in a ball of fear. I tell you, God does great things sometimes, but they're not always in, in glamorous places. Sometimes it's in just a very ordinary place in our life. God will do some of His greatest work in our lives. I do thank you for your tenderness. I hope and pray the word and encourage you today. That you, that you have been renewed in your belief. You know what? I don't understand. But I do believe God understands. I do believe God knows what He's doing. And I'm going to wait on Him. I'm going to trust Him with all my heart. I'm not going to lean upon my own understanding. I'm going to acknowledge Him. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father, we thank you for the story of Ruth. We love it. In some ways, in some ways, Lord, you, you've just given us something very plain, ordinary. Yet in there, there are these extraordinary truths. These things about you. And how you deal with your people. Your patience. Your love. Yet, yet also, dear Lord, your determination. You will chasten us. You will bring the rod out. But you don't do it because you're mad at us. You don't do it because you're angry. You don't do it because of a just impulsive wrath. You do it because you love us. You do it to get our attention. You do it to bring us back. And I do pray for my brother and sister here today. And Lord, I, I, I pray for that brother or sister who's struggling with something in life and and the enemy and the flesh is just really assailing upon them, dear Lord. And 
wanting them to have those doubtful questions about you, would you please grace them today to resist that? Lord, I pray for that individual who's here is not saved. As you showed mercy to Naomi and delivered her out of Moab, and the same for Ruth, I pray you'll help them know they're on the ground of mercy that they could be in hell. And I pray they'll call upon you and plead for that mercy upon their soul. And as we, with your blessing, continue in the book of Ruth, may we grow, not just in understanding the book, but more than understanding you. And, and, and it will be what the choir is saying. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Unto the uttermost, wonderful and glorious. Oh, what a Savior is mine. With our heads bowed in prayer, as James comes and begins to play music for us, I ask you to reflect upon it today. I ask you to give us prayerful, serious thought. What did you get out of it today? What did God give to you today from His Word? Honestly, what did you get? Was there a certain aspect there that seemed like a little bit of a, a spur that got caught? That's good. Got your attention. Why don't you dwell on that? What was the Lord saying, is saying to you? Maybe a response today would be to come and just find you a place of here to kneel and pray for a moment. And speak to your God. If you're here and you say, Preacher, Preacher, would you, would you speak to me? I want to be saved. I want to know Jesus. Oh, gladly I will. Just, just come on down this way. That doesn't save you, but I'd love to talk with you a moment about what it does mean to know Jesus. Could we quietly and prayerfully stand to our feet, please?